In this next flowchart, we're going to continue um, our discussion on linear electron flow. And this uh, next flowchart will just be entitled Linear Electron Flow 2. And specifically, I want to recall what our result is. The result of a, a linear electron flow. Linear electron flow results in photophosphorylation. Let's remember this as we continue our discussion. This is the key idea. How does it get to this point? We've gone through steps one through four in our previous video. We're going to finish off by looking at steps five through eight and prove this result of photophosphorylation. So moving on to step five. In our previous video, um, we established step four as the idea of going down an electron transport chain, specifically things like plastoquinone, cytochrome complex, plastocyanin. We went down that chain from PS2 all the way down to PS1. We've gone from the primary electron acceptor to PS1. We jumped onto the primary electron acceptor. He took us down electron transport chain, down those complexes, up to uh, photosystem one. So now, what we're going to establish also is that as the electron, um, these electrons are passing through the cytochrome complex, because remember, the cytochrome complex is a part of what? The electron transport chain. Cytochrome complex, let's say, in electron transport chain. So as the electrons are passing through cytochrome complex in electron transport chain, let's remember what's happening. It's very similar to respiration. I was sort of alluding to that in our previous video. What's happening is a bunch of protons are being pumped. So protons are pumped into, and this is a new sort of area, a thylakoid space now. Remember how there was an intermembrane space? Look how similar photosynthesis kind of is. As the electron is passing through the cytochrome complex in the electron transport chain, as the electron is going down this chain, it's creating H plus that's being pumped into the thylakoid space. Once it does that, we expect what to be created? This is going to create or creates an H plus gradient, of course. And whenever we create an H plus gradient, we know for a fact that that proton gradient is now going to cause something like chemiosmosis eventually to occur. And once we've caused chemiosmosis, this is going to, of course, lead to ATP formation. Remember, the light-dependent reactions, their overall goal is to create chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH two high energy molecules that are created out of the light energy that was harvested in step one. Step five is sort of a um, foreshadowing event of what's going to happen in the next three steps. So step five is just making sure that you understand that as the electron is moving down this chain, this is happening. Hydrogens are being pumped into the thylakoid space, which is then going to eventually create a gradient, which is eventually going to be chemiosmotically creating ATP. So moving forward, we've obviously established step five in our heads. We now sort of understand what we're going at, at photophosphorylation. But let's just look at step six now and continue the discussion of linear electron flow. Step six is the idea that light also hits PS1 reaction center complex, RCC. So what we have to understand is that PS2 is not the only one that's getting light on it. If we imagine um, this being PS1, so let's say this is PS1 and this is the thylakoid membrane, and PS2, or actually PS2 comes first, so that's PS2, and this is PS1. What we have to remember is that light is not only going to shine right on PS2. Light is huge. It's, it's pervasive. It's all over the place. So it's also going to shine on photosystem 1. And what's to say photosystem 1 isn't going to use that light? Why does it have to wait for the electron that's going to come from photosystem 2 to reach to it? Why does it have to wait? It doesn't have to. What's going to happen is this energy coming from the light as well is going to cause an excitation happening here as well as it is happening over there simultaneously. So it's not as simple as two is going to first get light and then one will eventually get light. They both get light at the same time. That's what step six is saying. So light also hits PS1 reaction center complex. This is going to cause the same exact thing that happened in PS2. This is going to, um, it excites an electron. It excites electron um, uh, within P700, because that's another way to talk about PS2. 
uh, or PS1, sorry, it excites an electron within P700. And once we've excited, excited an electron, that excited electron, we can say, excited electron must be transferred to who? Same exact thing, guys. Transferred to primary electron acceptor. Exactly the same thing is happening. Who's to say that PS1 cannot get in on, in on this uh, light energy fun of, you know, transferring electrons to primary electron acceptors? He uh, or she has every right to also lose an electron because light is causing a harvesting reaction happening here just as it is happening in PS2. So once we do that, we now know the consequence. P700 has lost an electron. What do you think I'm getting at? Oxidation is loss. P700 is then considered, P700 is oxidized. It's oxidized because it just lost an electron, just like PS2 did. So PS, P700 lost an electron and is oxidized to P700+. Plus. Do you think it's happy in this state? Of course not. It also becomes a strongly oxidizing agent. But you know what's amazing and what's absolutely uh, absolutely beautiful about this process. Remember how we had PS2 lose an electron and that electron went down the electron transport chain and got to PS1 through the electron acceptor sort of method? Why do you think it's going to PS1? Because P700, PS2, uh, why do you think it's going to PS1? P700, which is PS1. PS2 says, you know what, bro? I'm going to help you out. You just lost your electron. I know you're losing your electron just like I'm losing it. I get, I have this ability to get my electron back from H2O. You can't do that. But what you're going to get is this electron that I lost, and I'm going to help you out. That original electron that was excited from PS2 literally comes in and fills the void that's in PS1, and the void that PS2 had, we remember from our previous video, was filled in by H2O, the photolysis that happens. So we can write this down simply as saying we fix this problem, we fix this by using electron from P680 to fill the void. P680 lost its electron, but I said, you know what? P700, I understand you're feeling the same anger as me. Here's my electron. I get to break water and take his electron. I'm going to give you mine because it's better to get this excited electron into a normal state. And that's what's going to happen. That original electron, let's imagine this is the original electron, comes in here. And PS1 electron, remember, PS1's electron is now law, has been excited. It's gone. It's gone to a primary electron acceptor. But it's filled in by this guy. He comes in and says, you know what, bro, I got your back. And that's exactly what happens in step six. In step seven, now we can talk about the consequences of PS1 or P700 losing its electron. And you should be very familiar and comfortable with interchanging the idea of P700 and P680, PS, PS1 and PS2, because that's how it's going to be presented on the exams. They're going to be interchanged. So moving forward to step seven, PS1 electron, the one that got excited right here, this one, by the independent light photon, PS1 electron passes down a different write that in big letters, a different ETC until accepted, and you should know this next word, accepted by a molecule known as ferredoxin. Ferredoxin is usually abbreviated as FD. Ferredoxin will accept eventually that uh, our electron that was excited at PS1 by that independent new light photon that was mentioned in step six. So ferredoxin says, you know what, I'm going to calm this electron down. But you might be asking yourself, so if we're going down a separate electron transport chain, are we creating even more ATP? Because look at this situation we established here. Are we doing the same exact thing? again with this, or actually not, okay? This is sort of a nuance and something that a lot of students forget and often don't realize, is that step seven has this very important sort of non-function, let's say, of no H plus gradient forming. Make sure you understand that. Now, we don't need to understand the details as far as why it doesn't form, but just know that there's no H plus gradient from this separate electron transport chain found in PS1. What about PS2? Does PS2 create an H plus gradient? 
Yes, of course. I said it right here in step five. It creates H plus gradient. No H plus gradient in step seven because it's coming from the PS1 ETC. So what we can say overall, something you should absolutely know, is that no ATP whatsoever will come from the PS1 electron ETC. The electron moving down the ETC presented by PS1 does not produce any sort of ATP in this situation presented by step one. Okay, so fair, oh, and also I just forgot to mention ferrodoxin, it's the final electron acceptor in this situation. It's just a protein molecule um, with a, a, an iron on, in the center, and it's uh, again, like I said, labeled FD. But once again, step seven simply means that once the electron passes down this other separate electron transport chain, not the same as the one in five, not the same as the one in step five, it does not produce an H plus gradient and does not produce ATP. So this is something that tests often, often ask about because this is sort of a step that's lost in all of this jumbling sort of of electron. Where does it go? Who got excited? Who's accepting what? But this is something you should absolutely understand and know. And finally, in step eight, and we'll cl conclude on this, um, we're going to have um, two electrons from ferrodoxin. Because ferrodoxin, remember, it accepts that electron that was um, excited originally by PS1. So two electrons from ferrodoxin actually get passed to NADP. This is the final step in which NADP becomes NAD, uh, NADP plus. Excuse me. So this is in an oxidized state because we see plus. Whenever you see plus, it means oxidized. So that means it becomes an oxidizing agent. And if something is an oxidizing agent, what do we know? It absolutely wants an electron. It wants to be reduced back to its normal state, let's say. And that's what happens. What's going to happen is we're going to have two electrons from ferrodoxin pass to NADP plus and turning it into NADPH. Okay? So what we can say is that this reaction is catalyzed actually by a specific enzyme by NADP reductase. You should know this enzyme. It is the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction, this reduction of NADP, gaining an electron and going back to NADPH. And this NADPH will now form in the stroma and stay and be transported, let's say, into stroma. Why is it transported into the stroma? Because it will eventually be used with ATP um, and NADPH. They both will be used and used in specifically the carbon fixation reactions that we'll talk about in future videos. So overall, we've established the end of linear electron flow. This electron that originally was excited has this has these many different steps that can occur, but overall, we established this idea of photophosphorylation. I'm actually going to get into this in much uh, more specific detail because I think it definitely deserves this whole topic. One final summary video because there's a lot of steps to sort of um, consume, a lot of steps to understand. We're going to summarize everything in one final video on a linear electron flow right after this.